I'm uh, Kyle Kapizzi. I've uh, been floating around trying to cause a little trouble in biodiesel here and there since about 2004 and formally uh, left the other work I was doing in 2008 uh, work, work on a couple startups uh, related to biodiesel uh, quality testing. Uh, I'm back home in Washington State now and uh, working with uh, Dan, Dr. Dan's Biodiesel and Sustainable Fuel Co-op. Uh, my uh, current uh, uh, preoccupation is with uh, a, 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 an automated uh, pump controller system for a number of reasons, uh, uh, most of which is we need to get fuel out 24-7 to people and uh, frankly uh, it's about five times higher volume at the 24-hour pump that Dan has versus a uh, what was a uh, espresso stand monitored pump that folks had to walk in and pay cash uh, or uh, get charged, uh, you do credit card charge within the building. Uh, the unfortunate and uh, uh, I think opportune news for that station is that it's now moved. Uh, the espresso shop closed and we're now going to automate that station, plop it in place, do 24 hours. We looked at some options, commercial options. Dan has used uh, uh, an e-fueling setup in the past, uh, which uh, has, has had its, its uh, various troubles and uh, also is higher expense. So um, we began looking into the, the options that were out there and uh, happened upon uh, an open source uh, uh, document, do, partial documentation of it and also uh, the example, uh, working example of it in Baltimore Biodiesel Co-op. So uh, I, I uh, was working for uh, the Sustainable Fuel Co-op trying to get the uh, uh, process together to, to simply buy one of these and came to the realization that we were going to have to build one. Uh, began working with uh, the original designer of this and uh, started looking at how we can make improvements. Um, that's an ongoing process right now. And uh, this example and another uh, are out in the field, if you will, uh, and I'll uh, introduce uh, Martin here uh, to talk about that one that's in the field. A um, couple of criteria that I had in looking at a 24/7 pump: simply, a, you know, very efficient system, something that will communicate uh, to members and, and uh, give us uh, all the information we need. Uh, flexible enough to be deployed in different ways. This particular one can be deployed. Uh, using 110 volt pumps and using 12 volt pumps uh, and consequently can also be used for solar. So standalone solar power stations uh, and a um, uh, cellular network will allow you to even potentially have portable stations if a municipality would allow it. And finally, uh, low cost. Uh, the uh, problem always with free is that uh, it never is and you get to build it uh, and so we've got a, a, quite a number of hours and a, a, a number of headaches into what's currently here. What we want to do is make sure that all the rest of you don't have to do that. And um, I think it's really possible uh, with the work we've done on improving the board and uh, the, uh, the, the time we've put into it now to better understand the components and how everything can go together in a much tighter package. Uh, we're, uh, we're ready to uh, get that out to everyone that needs a pump controller. So, uh, Martin uh, uh, is uh, president of the uh, Baltimore Biodiesel Co-op, and uh, we're really happy you made it out. Thanks, Kyle. Everybody. Um, I'm really glad to be here. Um, so, I've, I've been running Biodiesel for probably six years, or seven, six or seven years, and I joined in with uh, Baltimore Biodiesel in 2009, and recently Okay, president, so representing uh, what we do out there, uh, we have two uh, kiosks. One is solar powered. Um, both of them use the solar network. Um, we have 100, 120 uh, active members, uh, probably a third of which are really um, consistent, you know, weekly or monthly purchasing um, of most of our fuel. Um, so, what I just briefly want to do is I. I created a, a little video um, early on um, Thursday morning. So 
hopefully people will be able to kind of see the LCD display a little bit um, as it runs. Um, it has like a little scrolling um, feature when um, it's idle. And it, it is actually backlit in the nighttime, so it's actually a nice feature. So um, basically just gonna run through me buying some fuel. I just swipe my card, it recognizes my name. Um, I enter in a um, number, like my, my Mark, number. Mark, do you mind if, I, if we interrupt with some questions along the way? It's, it's yeah, really it's quick. Question, it kind of goes quick. Maybe we can like, kind of run through it a couple times. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, so what happened right in that moment is uh, my membership in the co-op is up for renewal, so it actually asked me to renew um, at the kiosk. I actually declined at that moment. Um, and then what it does is pre-authorize me for 20 gallons. Um, our price right now is $450 um, a gallon, so $90. Um, and once the pre-auth goes through, um, the door is electronically unlocked and you just open the door. And you can see in there, um, there's a pump. Um, and there's my golf getting fuel. Um, there is a pulser that pulses the um, flow of the fuel. Uh, so the kiosk, um, uh, you kind of see like where it's located uh, alongside this um, sort of industrial building, and uh, it counts on the left the gallons, about half gallons. On the right is the amount, twenty-four dollars seventy cents is my purchase. Uh, question? I was going to ask, what kind of? It looked like a Tudgel farm here on there. Is that a yeah, I think it's it's a. Um, Gas boy. Yeah. Pump. It's um, not. A, it's not. This one is not a certified pump. Right. So and that's what your question is. Yeah, that was going to be so my I'm question about. Okay. I'm I'm a follow up. Yeah. So you're pulsing on. Do you have a specific pulser for that bar meter, or do you just kind of take your own pulser and set it to what that meter is doing? Uh, it's not really related to the meter on the pump. Um, I mean, the pump does have its own like analog um, counter on it, um, but. I think it's a, it's a GPI uh, electronic thing that they hacked into. Yeah, we basically like sort of modified um, this, this flow meter to pulse. Uh, yeah. pulse. The, the meter is a flow meter. But it's not something that's voice measure certifiable. No, it's not because um, as a you know, member only um, kind of a, a fleet, you know, we uh, all agree basically to take the amount that we say we're, we're dispensing. So what we'll do and what I've got up here is uh, a meter repulsor that will be attached to a waste and measure certified pump. So that's what I'm wondering about. It's like I know our computer, you know, even though it's a mechanical computer, on our dispensers, waste and measure certified, if we didn't put a pulsor, then that computer, where, how does the pulsor fit into? Is it the computer that reads it or is it the pulsor that reads it? Pulsar has to be waste measure certified. It's it's, to a third party the, display. The pulsar will be the stock part that comes on your weights and measures legal pump. So it takes. Have a pulsar. It's so it's you, <coughs> they make one for it. Right. Okay. And that's a weights measure certified. Yeah. Right. Viable yeah. part. Yeah. Right. The, the beauty of this is that this is all back end to what gets certified. They've deployed it in a way that is not. A weights and measures certified, but our intent is to deploy it on a weights and measures certified pump. So they save two thousand dollars because it's not for public resale. Sure. Uh, the, you want to? Almost everybody wants to do it for public resale. That's what we're going to do. Have you, I'm just curious. Have you considered using a cal like we have a calibration vessel, for example, that's like a thousand bucks, the stainless steel thing. It's got this little meter, and you get that calibrated legally, and then you can calibrate your pumps with that. It might be something to consider if you ever have any issues. We have one that's kind of uh, we haven't used it yet, but it is. You know, it's and that's there. what the weights measures certified guys use yes. when uh, they come and check your pumps. So you get approved. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you certainly get that very well. Um, we, I mean, we haven't run into any issues um, so far. We actually um, um, manually enter the amount of fuel that gets uh, delivered into the tank that's a 500 gallon tank. And um, so we'll go into the admin version of our you know, section of our website, um, put in, you know, we got 250 gallons in there right now. 
Um, and as purchases occur and they're being counted with the, our measure, um, it'll decrease our um, inventory for us, and we can check that online. Um, the system's actually set up to send automatic email alerts when it's a below a, a predetermined amount of um, inventory. So that's so we actually so it use, it's used for the pulsar is used for sales, but it's also used for checking our inventory. That's great. So and it seems accurate enough uh, for our purposes thus far in the last three years. Um, and and then we if we get down to five gallons, that's when we kind of turn it off. So we don't go below that. So so that when you you get pre off for thirty gallons or thirty yeah. bucks or whatever, you can actually each member can set that so you can. So up to 40 but, but nonetheless, it's whatever, whatever it is, and then you're filling yeah. up. Yeah. Will the pump stop when it reaches that limit? I believe so. I've never gotten. I've uh, never that, those are the, the, my question yeah. is more in kind of how that works, not yeah. whether or not these things are certified or all right. that. Right. But it's 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 plugging into the cellular network to authorize. When you do that, it's like boom, yeah. money's there. Yeah. When you shut it off, the money comes back. Remainder. Kind of yeah. Thing, um, proper cert. Um, but I mean, the there's a process. Right? Have you seen how pre off on yeah, systems I mean, not, work? You can pre off and then yeah. complete the sale. Basically. So the so the sale actually occurs after, after. The, the the final product number is known. Right. So um, there's a process when you hang it up. It goes and completes that process. Yeah. And so that, that's like sort of the very tail end of that video. Um, you can see actually right the session gets spot because you can see our pretty low tech pump. Um, it's got you know your typical latch to mm -hmm. hang your yeah, um, turns it on. and the thing is turned on. So what happens at the end of the transaction or, or what becomes the end of it is when you know I hang up the nozzle and uh, it turns the pump off that tells the computer this transaction's finished, send the amount of money that is. So that's from the pulser determined how much it was. Right. That's what completes yeah, your transaction. That, that You're filling really up based on the gauge on the pump. But the actual amount comes off the pulser, which yeah, and and it's, so it's whatever. So it's right there on the LCD. Um, okay, it says what it is. It actually, goes. And I'll talk a little bit places. about kind of the. There are a number of criteria we had that made this uh, an appealing system to start working on and improving because it it does much of what a commercial system does. In fact, does a few things better, and that's. Um, that's why, frankly, I spent the time on it. What's in the box? In the the yeah. steel box? Um, we'll see it up here. I've ordered it out. Yeah. So. Um, um, you're also seeing on this picture of the what folks are referring to. And the pulser is back in here. Right. Um, that is this version is actually <laughs> one that that Ilya, one of the one of the Baltimore folks, built. So it's a paddle wheel or something. That that one is most of them. This particular one is a reed switch, uh, magnetic reed switch. And from what I understand, you can buy a GPI meter that usually is mounted in a hose, sure. uh, and it has uh, what looks like a foam jack in it. Uh, so you can. <coughs> yeah, this is that. fairly developed. Pick off the kettle. Yep. So a couple of other just brief uh, features. Um, the nozzle is an auto shaw, so you don't spooch fuel out of place um, when the tank's full. Uh, and then finally, uh, like we were saying, you know, the amount gets sent by cell phone data to um, fill the card. And then the kiosk will also send an email to the email account on the file for your account, uh, for your membership, um, with a receipt. So, you know, after you pump in, the price of that, um, and that um, occurs within um, a minute, they're probably at most usually, uh, and um, it's not every membership has an email attached to it, but we really try to get everybody to sign up. So I want to ask you, when I've priced out systems from, uh, let's say, you know, like they always include a book for a printer that says this is required. Um, have you, and this may just vary by state, but I wonder if, if there's been any research done that, uh, just like the Apple Store, you go to the Apple Store and they don't give you a print out receipt. Yeah. You know, and is there any like legal precedent to say, I will not provide a printer because I will require an email address and all invoices will be sent through email? 
Um, so I'm not super familiar with any like local laws on that. Um, that's always been the design. Like we never had a printer ever on it, um, and I imagine that if it's not explicitly part of the membership agreement, that that is you know you're sort of implicitly agreeing to whatever our system is. You know, right. Right. I totally get that. So right. what we're trying to do is figure out you know how do we take what's probably eighty percent of what we need. Since you don't do retail, there's like all these questions right. that come to mind. If in Texas I have to have a printer, then either your software has to be adjusted to be able to print, which could be a huge undertaking, or I mean, somebody else. If that one thing is required, you know, by state law. Um, so these are just things that I, you know, we need to kind of cycle through as we go. And I imagine, I mean, sure it's doable. It's just sort of over time and resource kind of question. Right. Yeah. Um, when you set up the membership, it has a credit card number associated with it and all that. How is that credit card number provided to the system? Yeah, so um, it's interesting. Uh, so you can sign up. I, when I signed up, I did it with like a paper app with application. Sort of send it in, um, very old school. You can use the kiosk to, to become a member to sign up. Okay. Um, and you sort of use the buttons on the Google Touch pad to agree to the terms, basically, which are like printed okay. on the paper line and paper there. And, um, you don't give a credit card number associated with you have a name associated with your membership, but any card with your name on it, as long as it matches well, it's it's any credit card, it'll okay. create like, the name to match that membership and then fill that card number. Okay, so there's no card data stored. No. Okay, good. Well, that means you don't have to see the CI Um so not familiar with it, but so you can store credit card data. Um, so, it doesn't store credit card data, so yeah. it doesn't need to be PCI compliant. It uses uh, the all all required encryption and processes. This current one processes through AuthorizeNet, so you you are you are completely compliant in in actual credit card handling. That was a major criteria for us. Is there anybody else? Let me um, just show you a couple things on our um, website. Um, so this photo or this uh, shot here um, shows the home page, um, Baltimore by diesel.org. We um, have a nice little widget with a carbon tracker, so we kind of calculate um, the carbon savings um, based on using uh, B99 and blend the winner. We prorate that. Um, we have the two kiosks, like I mentioned, it has um, the status, the amount of uh, fuel based on, again, the inventory uh, for each one. Um, and the, um, the new member login is where you would enter your email address uh, if you were new. Um, the existing member is where I would sign in, um, which is uh, the next um, page. And what for me, this is my account, so I can um, View my purchases, and of course, in addition to the email uh, receipts that I receive. So the purchase that I had made on the video is the top one. Um, it was again five and a half gallons, um, twenty-four dollars and seventy cents. Um, so, and then you know, kind of gives me some totals and some um, uh, additional information on the bottom to sort of sum up what I've done, and then. Uh, this next one, as an administrator, I have additional rights, so I can actually see everybody um, who purchases. So we've got actually um, data since the inception of the um, the kiosk um, to document and you know, track of all of our sales. Um, so we can and we can see you know, who's buying. Um, we right now I think we're selling about three thousand dollars. Take um, on right now um, of product, and um, just want to note. Um, so, so just a couple other quick things. Um, because we have the email addresses, there is a functionality to broadcast to send out you know, messages to the membership. Um, we again track our um, inventory. On, under fuel delivery, so we can see, you know, exactly how much we have in 
in our tanks and in our uh, storage facility. We have a uh, vendor that stores our fuel up for us. Um, you can add additional people onto your membership. And so if, if again, they swipe a card, that's the name on it, they will be able to buy fuel. Um, and then, of course, we also, for admin, we have uh, member management rights um, to, uh, for our uh, membership. Um, so if you purchase one of these systems, the hardware, is this code going to be available? And is it something we're subscription based or is it you just be up for you to buy the hardware and be able to put this for our own websites? Yeah, um, about that there's not there's like a subscription for uh, involved at all. Um, you would have is this um, house on your server and then Well so that's what you can say is you would have the option as far as you, you would need the data for the cell connection. Right. Um, I think it's like fifteen bucks a month or something for us. Uh, and then you could have your own server, you could serve your own gateway to and then do like authorize.net or uh, or um, multiple values we could um, provide that. Um, uh, and then you know in the future if there was interest in kind of having a more um, centrally um, managed um, um, server, you know, it could become uh, you know, potentially something that is, a, sort of, so to speak, collectively run, you know, something for the benefit of, of various co-ops. That's probably better, I think, just yeah. in terms of security issues, updates, and have somebody that knows how to do it, centralized, yeah. rather yeah. than everybody trying to figure it out. Around. And well, yeah. one of the reasons that uh, I invited the Baltimore folks, and appreciate that they came on short notice, was that we need to figure this out. The the discussion that Dan and I have had with Martin and, and the Baltimore folks is how do we make this something that's readily available, easily accessible, properly updated, safe, right. and we also may have the opportunity to have big data with with small biodiesel now. Because if we share if we are willing to share this information around the country and know what people are doing in smaller Places where generally, you know, you you may have been working off of a pump model, a, a, a key model, or even basic, you know, five-gallon tote distribution type of things. Um, it's never been quantified very well. Well, I think it'd be nice to do a tiny like Jason software, for instance, this right. on programming, obviously, and a lot of resources, but to be able to have something like our town and most towns where you want to be able to collect the oil, make the fuel, distribute it, to be able to like the same track all that, but the consumers know. As powerful as I think we would be able to sign up for the program and get to donate degrees sort by the building. Yes. Well, what I was going to say is, is potentially, I mean, I have the domain biodieselcontrolcenter.com and biodieselsoftware.com. I mean, you know, maybe we could consider, because I've got, you know, a website that's hosted by at Rackspace. Uh, I mean, it's something to consider if you have a big programmer. A programmer can own that part of the code or, you know, own the management of it. I mean, um, I mean with open source software, you really have to think about is this bunch of different installations everywhere or like if you look at Red Hat you know there was obviously the Linux kernel that Red Hat had this great model about we're supporting it I mean personally I'm going to need somebody to come out and install it configure it figure authorize that configure it for our web server if we did it on our own and not essentially you know, I need a lot of, of setup and support time because we're really running a business yeah and I recognize that this today is ready for uh, co-ops need somebody to provide the hardware and the software support so when it, when it stops working you can be able to call somebody and, and as a you know as a software supplier myself I recognize I'm not a software company but by a company and I do kind of support for people that have problems and I kind of wonder what direction is this going to take and who's going to own it who's going to support it or if it's open source are we kind of going to build a community around trading message boards about this is my issue today with the software and how can we improve this I think it's a big discussion. Yeah, that's, you know, one, one issue where Piedmont's had problems with, you know, even just the e-feeling. E-feeling doesn't provide that type of support that you actually yeah. need. And so we've had to cultivate that ourselves in-house, and, you know, that's their product, and you still have to, even though it's not open source, and you pay for it, you still have to find that expertise. And, and frankly, that that is where you know, coming, uh, my perspective coming from seeing what the experience of the feeling with Dan's 
sequenced um, and knowing that there isn't a, another product out there that you know is worth paying the, the, the twelve to thirty thousand dollars for um, this made a lot of sense to develop and, um, and also as far as I know this has been incredibly reliable it has um, I would say you know sort of to be try, try to be pretty honest about it uh, and, yeah, back to example. did you uh, I guess did you use like the T-Mobile network for this, and did you, you do a business account machine to machine, or did you just do a personal account on like, the two dollar day with unlimited data? I guess how do you um, structure it towards how I honestly, virtual calls. I just, honestly, I'm um, not 100 percent sure what the vendor is. I know that there's um, it's a sort of line of sight connection, so we have like, an antenna just like points at the oh. tower, uh, and it's and it's just like this little small super cheap data only plan mm -hmm. so that's kind of what i know about it yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 the reason why i'm saying we're taking around the little gpro safety command uh, sim card based mm -hmm. just have one so i'm gonna pull you guys out enough yeah one. i think that's yeah i think we do have um mm -hmm. use the sim card based like something something yeah uh, the hardware that you're using in Baltimore, is it considered uh, kind of weatherproof and what are you doing to, to keep it away from the elements? Yeah. Yes, um, the um, kiosk, so their, the setup is in, on both is this cage, right, with the tank inside and pump. Um, and it's, it's, that's open to elements, but the um, computer and everything is in this stainless steel weatherproof box. Yeah, and um, some of the uh, upgrades that Delia has been working on, who has been designing and refining the hardware and did the software, is to to upgrade some some of the um, sort of weatherproof uh, sort of uh, you know capabilities of some of the hardware, particularly you know the Baltimore area, Maryland's climate isn't super extreme, so but but if we're going to like this area, you know, it need to be to a lower temperature, you know, able to work in a lower temperature. So he's been working on some of that. Yeah. How much did that cost right there? Um, yeah, well, the, the tank, the yeah, cage, the, the solar, <laughs> the batteries. How much you spent on that? So mm. I'm not totally sure. We had a, 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 a grant from the state of Maryland Department of Environment, which helped to fund that. Um, that was a custom um, made like metal worker custom do the cage for us and everything. Um, so that's so I'm sure it's around the sort of like eight to ten grand area, I'm sure. So, so to me an important yeah. question is like you have all this cage and doors and stuff like that. Yeah. Is that just to prevent somebody from picking up a nozzle that isn't turned on anyway? Um I think it's just um, like what's inside that box, the cage? Inside the cage, the hose and the pump. Itself. Yeah, it's just the, the, nozzle. the it's just uh, the pump and the, the nozzle and the hose. But yeah. couldn't you just make it turn the nozzle? Mm -hmm. uh, just turn it on. on with that relay. They wipe out with all the cage and a door. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's well, it yeah. because the pump's manual. Yeah, you have to go, have to go and actually to pump like off. But, but yeah. if, you, if you left it on and you used a relay and just turned it to pump on. on. Right. Like if, in other words, if you left it in the on position and right. had a relay, because that's the way commercial dispensers work, is use a relay and turn it on. And, you know. But what this you volunteer was never intended for sale, right? Like, I mean, I guess it's a little unclear to me what you're presenting, whether this is like the, the thing that I want to go and sell or the thing that I created to scratch my own itch, which it seems like what you're showing us mm -hmm. is what you developed in Baltimore right. to service Baltimore. your your own constituents in your group. And then the development that's gone post that is what the second part of this discussion is. Like this is not, we're not vetting their design on their co-op. No, yeah. right? Yeah. right, like, right? Like yeah. I'm just yeah. saying, like, you yeah. got a great thing that you produce. Yeah. And that's, the so yeah. that's certainly been my take on this, is they've made something that's pretty damn amazing. Right. And we took the approach of can we make? Can we package this into hardware that <coughs> many people can use? I think that's not only possible. I think we've pretty got pretty close to where that will <coughs> work. We're going to use an old Gasboy kiosk, not do 
a separate caged sure. thing. So to answer the question of can it do that, absolutely. All communication with this uh, current one is DB9 serial. That can trap, that's not, it's not uh, a huge limitation on length of, of cord. Uh, you can use amplifiers if you need to. The other part of that question, I think, uh, or that you were asking, is can I buy one? Well, is that what you're presenting? I, I guess th there's two different discussions right. on these two so, different people. Yeah. Is this is what your core technology innovation came from, and this is my product development into the product that I'm available to sell. It's totally separate issues. Totally separate yeah, products. So, right, exactly. So what right, I said is what worked for us. Right, exactly. The example of was doing something the pre-story of have better and more adequate. Yeah. Yeah. The white station was your low volume co-op station. Absolutely. And the, the door I was just was, saying the discussion was getting was, confused around the right. development the door of the to prevent vandalism. Right. Yeah. But but the discussion was about product the product issues of the the prototype right. proving the concept of what they've done. Right. Which is not really yeah. at all. What what we want to do is to package the uh, a turnkey point of sale device so you can apply it to whatever retail application that, that uh, you absolutely. Need. So how far have you gone in that? Process, I guess, is my question, which is um, where, of course, you were going to go. They want one today, by the way. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you're ready to start. We want one. Checks. We want one today <laughs> too, and that's why I built it. <laughs> and if everyone wanted to buy your prototype, is what, what the discussion was about. Of that's course, ago, right? And well. and some people have tried. Um, the main question that we tried to answer was, can we build this just from the documentation that's there? And the answer was no. And so, we've put probably a couple hundred hours into the work necessary to understand what this is, in addition to working with <coughs> the Baltimore folks, specifically Ilya, in changing this board so that it will be a lot more accessible. This is version 3.2 in their, in their parlance. Uh, they're now up to version 3.4. Uh, this, this was through whole soldered hand work typical prototype stuff. The new version is surface mount, much better designed, uh, and uh, it will absolutely have more protection built into it. I built protection into this one, uh, so we couldn't fry the board, uh, but uh, that's all built in the new version. So the answer to your question is, uh, we're hoping to have working units really freaking soon because I need three of them. Uh, and we want to take orders for a chunk of them. We're going to have a bunch of boards built. Um, and it certainly makes sense to, to build them you know, all at the same time. So we're going to get this one running and install and prove it. Uh, and then uh, um, and build a, a then you can send out an email and take orders. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in this open source code world, like, build a board and, uh, and and I buy you know a system from you and uh, you know my customer swipes a card and I go, oh, yeah there's a bug. Is Ilya you know I've never met him, I've talked to him on the phone and they is he gonna go fix that bug? And if he doesn't fix it, I mean I, and I recognize this is an emerging world so I'm not saying what's the answer. And this is but, why um, our discussion has been around the Co-op as a volunteer organization may not be what or what would ever support this in a nationwide type of scenario. A simple LLC that supports this is the most likely scenario. Um, so, so they potentially contract with Ilya as an individual to provide that sort of developer on contract support. I mean that's what I do for BCC. I've got an awesome developer and paid by the hour and fix it. It seems like it's a model that works for me, and it, I don't know the relationship between Ilya and the co-op, and if anybody's claiming any intellectual property over there, but if you're saying it's open source, perhaps it's just whoever has the expertise to yes. use the so that would, have, it would be, right? I mean, that's how the open source uh, thing goes. These guys are getting closer, do you have any idea of what the prices would be? Obviously, you're going into production, or maybe 
more advanced development for people that want it? Would it be helpful to add almost like a Kickstarter campaign for people that want to give you a bit of money to sort of? Well, up? I'm glad that you mentioned that <laughs> because I've already put in place a campaign with with uh, some uh, fellow classmates that's actually not a donation campaign. Um, it's through community source capital. Um, because we are in Washington State, we can do that. Uh, the, the, the community source capital campaign allows you to buy $50 increments up to $250 uh, as individuals to support it. Uh, and that's actually a loan program. It would probably be a loan uh, in, in this uh, current scenario would be a revenue-based loan uh, to Dr. Dance. Uh, that's what we looked at uh, as a way to support moving his pump and putting this system together. Uh, I haven't released that campaign yet because I also know that there's a bunch of smart people in the room and I needed the feedback to understand whether you were all willing to do this. I sent a couple of uh, emails out to some select folks uh, prior to this to determine what the, the funding picture would look like. and. Frankly, this is the community that I was interested in talking with about that first. We can put it out on a Kickstarter, we can do all of that, but you as interested users are far more important to me as a as someone developing something like this than than a typical person that shares it on Facebook and says, cool, this is great. Well, well, I think that's like an example for me. Yeah. Yeah. The thing that I like about Kickstarter, and I've, I've done a lot with Kickstarter, I mean, you know, lots of stuff with Kickstarter, uh, is if you were to put, for example, uh, you know, if you donate, uh, we'll just say $3,000, then you get a unit. Anything less than that, you get different things, like you get support or whatever. Uh, and, you know, cash. <laughs> yeah. So I'll send you a letter. If I can pay for it up front, the Kickstarter campaign, if the campaign isn't successful, you don't pay, you know, you know, I wouldn't pay the money. Um, that's what I like about that model. Any other model that, that sort of preserves that idea that would allow me to pay up front, uh, know that I'm going to get a unit, I mean, my shipping date is going to be one of the first ones shipped. Um, anything that preserves that idea that I'm not just throwing my, or funding your experiment, but that it's more like a pre-purchase. Even if it was only 75% refundable to fund your experiment, I mean, I, you know, I'm very interested in that yeah. kind of model. We want to do a better job than Tesla. This is a great product. Yeah, yeah. but they took uh, they took full payment pre-orders years in advance. But those people, what, what have kind of things have you done to move it from the prototype yeah. to what you're doing? Like, how far along actually are you? I, I mean, I mean, this is kind of what I do for a living. But how close are you to product? Like, I see a new box of parts, and that the, that well, scares the box, me. In the box of parts, of right? course, is is why the reason I brought this. Um, is because we were building this for ourselves.